It's great to see you here. Great to have you here worshiping with us. Today is the Lord's Day. So we're here to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. You know, it dawned on me the other day um, that oftentimes on Sunday you have all these uh, sporting events. You think about how many thousands of people go to watch these things. To see someone uh, catch a ball or, or someone throw a pass or, or someone race a car or all those excellent things. And, and something interesting about what we're doing here today. When I talk about us, we're here to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. You realize if what we believe is true, that has happened once in human history where someone resurrected themselves and someone who's still alive. And so I think about all these people flocking to see someone do something that other people can do or have done. And here we flock here to celebrate something. Jesus conquered death, friend. And the Bible teaches if He conquered death for us, that means in Him we conquered death as well. He's conquered the greatest enemy known to mankind. Someone may be able to throw a pass, but they cannot rise from the dead. They have not conquered anything for you. Though they may conquer Alabama on Saturday, right? Amen? Or Florida. Unfortunately, the next season, those two teams come back. And you know what? Jesus died and rose from the dead once for all. Friend, we, we come to celebrate that reality today, so I want to encourage you to think about that. I appreciate you being here, even though you lost an hour of sleep, right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen, right? But I'm thankful that you're here. If this is your first time visiting with us, you'll notice in your bulletin on the side here that there's a perforate section. We ask our folks, our new folks, to fill that out so we can have a record of your visit. And you'll just stick that in the offering plate. you also notice, Christians, that uh, in the queue there next to you is a uh, clipboard. We ask our folks to just sign their name, pass that down the queue so that we can have a record of your attendance here today with us. Thank you so much for being here, friends. Let's start with some brief announcements. Now, our men's basketball league is starting tomorrow evening. If you're wanting to serve with that league, please let me know. But be prayer for that because we have 12 teams. There's going to be, there's going to be people involved in that uh, men's league that are not believers. And so they're going to hear the gospel before every single game that we play. And so be in prayer that some of those men and some of those in attendance would repent and believe in Christ, that they will see how valuable Jesus is. And also, our Good Friday service is coming up March 30th at 6 p.m. So remember our seven sayings that Jesus said before his death, right? We're, we're going to be sharing those. There's going to be seven preachers here. They're going to take eight to ten minutes each and preach each of those sayings, right? Hey, we did good last year. We did good last year. We were on time, except for the except me. I, I went over a little bit. I was the last one, though, right? Uh, but we preach for 8 to 10 minutes on each thing, so I want to encourage you to be a part. I know that the pastor from Fredonia is going to be here. The pastor from First Presbyterian is going to be here. Um, Robert Lawrence is going to be, be here. He's a retired preacher at Isseline Baptist. And um, Pastor of Midway Baptist and Poodle is going to be here. Pastor of uh, Cedar Hill Baptist and Baxter is going to be here. And me, Brother Mom. And what day is that? That is March 30th, Good Friday. March 30th, Good Friday. And then Saturday is our Easter egg hunt at 10 a.m. Thank you so much for bringing those Easter eggs and the uh, candy. We've got, we still need more. We're wanting to fill those baskets up when those kids search. And uh, amen, right? And you remember Easter egg hunts. You want to fill those baskets up. So please continue to donate those items. And I'm excited about that. And Easter Sunday is April 1st. We will observe the Lord's Supper that morning. And there will be no evening worship that evening. All right, you see the other items in there. Any other announcements? Y'all see this insert here, right? Week of Prayer for North American Missions. This month, we're getting towards the um, Annie Armstrong North American Missions offering, and 100% of what you give goes towards North American Missions. So you can earmark your check, so you can put it in an envelope, but let us give towards Southern Baptist causes in part concerning North American missions. And it really is an amazing ministry that they have. And there are many in North America who still have not heard the gospel. Do you realize that there are still unreached people groups in North America? People who have, do not have a gospel witness? Now in our damn time, that's hard to believe, but it's the truth. 
It's the truth. And so if we cannot go, we send others. We send others. All right, anything else, friends? All right, well, we come to worship the Lord here today. So would, would you bow with me this time? Let's prepare our hearts for worship. And the way we do that is by admitting that we need the one that we're about to sing to in the back. Would you bow with me? Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity to come and to worship you. I thank you that you sent your son to live the life that you required me to live. And then he died the death that I deserved. He didn't stay dead. He conquered death in my stead. And he's alive today. Sitting at your right hand. And one day he's coming back to get his people. But Lord, in the meantime, may we live for you. And may I get up and sing like someone who has been spiritually resurrected. Physical resurrection is coming. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let's stand and encourage one another in the name of Christ here this morning.
Let's continue in our uh, worship and song, we're starting with uh, hymn number seven of the God will make a way, and then seven of five is will of us. So we all.
contact the church. And I think they had my, my cell number or my telephone number there. If not, just call me and Joe. She didn't know. <laughs> anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we're just thankful for this time, Lord, for we're able to come and Lord, just to worship you. And Father, to be able to return to you that portion of which you've given us. Pray, Lord, now that it be blessed for thy use to uplift in thy kingdom. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
I didn't figure you would. Have you ever seen a license plate on the back of a vehicle that has a that says something? Yeah. Alright, so if you were to look at that one, what do you think that says?
has action that comes with it. Now, I'm, I'm reminded of that uh, reality. You know, me and uh, Amber, my wife and I, were on vacation with family in Gatlinburg area, and we went to a place called Wonder Works. And you know what it says, you're going into, uh, I believe, Gatlinburg. There's that place that looks upside down, and uh, it's Wonder Works. So we went there, and I think Kate and Amber were around, uh, Kate was around six, I was around four. And up in, when you go inside there, you get in there eventually, and, and they've got this ropes like horse that's that goes up, you know, three or four stories. And they'll they'll hook you. You have this harness around your waist and they'll hook you into the ceiling and you can go up up in that around on these little bitty wires up in that you know three or four stories. And so Amber and I the kids were wanting to do it, Kate and Abel were, so we figured, well, they'll come down. They won't they won't uh, they they'll get up there and want to come down, they'll get scared. And so I was following, which one was I following? Okay, I was following Kay. And we was following Ava. And they got up there and they weren't scared. And they just kept going higher and higher and higher. And uh, it was one of the worst points of my life. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't say that sarcastic. I thought I was going to fall. It was awful. If you've ever done that thing, because you're putting your faith in whoever designed that thing that's got you strapped. So you're putting your faith in the, in the steel or whatever's got you, this harness thing. And that whoever designed this thing that's hanging over your head, the engineer, you're, you're putting your trust in those people, right? So I had a very little faith, so I was worried. So I was worried, and I was praying the whole time. <laughs> praying the whole time. And the kids would just run across those ropes. Uh, but I say all that to say that I'm thankful it takes just a small amount of faith for us to be saved. You know, I believe that's Jesus' point with the story of the mustard seed. Uh, that it takes a small amount of faith. And I'm thankful for that reality. But particularly what we're looking at today is people who had faith. And what, what's interesting about these people is how unremarkable they are. Now we think of how they're celebrated in the Bible, but we're about to read about Abraham and Sarah and how the Bible was commending towards them. And we're going to see their sin. You know, the, the, he, the author of Hebrews doesn't emphasize their sin, but if you go back and read their stories, you read the stories concerning Abraham, you learn that Abraham at one point doubted God, that Sarah doubted God, doubted that he would bring about the child of promise, and actually committed an adultery. And had a child with another woman. And Sarah encouraged him to do it. And so we're going to look at these stories. And see the importance of their faith. And how it led them to pursue obedience to God. But we're also, if you read the Old Testament, you know that these folks failed. And that's something I, I think that proves Christianity true. Is if you're writing a book about yourself... I don't know about you, but if I'm doing an autobiography, I'm leaving all the bad stuff out. Right? And Moses is, is the one who, spoke, who wrote uh, the first five books of the Bible. And yet, these men who are of renown, who are to be celebrated, warts and all are included. Right? The sins that they committed, the failure that they had. And so the emphasis has got to be on God's glory. And as I was studying faith and thinking through how the righteous live by faith, I, lo I love reading about missionaries who came before. And I was reminded about a man named John G. Patton. And uh, it wasn't until 1606, there was a Spanish explorer named Fer Fernandez de Quiros. He discovered a chain of 80 islands stretched across 450 miles in the South Pacific. It was later named the New Hebrides, I believe is how it's pronounced. The islands were inhabited by peoples whose existence had been unknown to the rest of the world for centuries. It would be another 230 years before two London missionaries made the first earnest attempt to get the gospel to these unreached people. And that was in 1839. The problem is, is that these people were cannibals. And those two English missionaries, within minutes of getting on the island, were killed, martyred, and eaten. John G. Patton and his wife, 19 years later, 
set sail to the islands. But this decision didn't come without much criticism. I mean, imagine if your son or daughter is going to go to the island of cannibals to share the gospel. On one account before leaving, a respected elder in his church chided the couple, You will be eaten by cannibals. To which Pat responded, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I came to live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. What's amazing is that Patton had a successful ministry where he was at, and he was in his homeland in Scotland, Glasgow. He was a missionary, an urban missionary, to those who were impoverished in Glasgow. And so he had this successful ministry. So the question is, what compels someone with a successful ministry, a pregnant wife, to head to an island of cannibals to share the gospel? And the simple answer is faith. Faith that God is sovereign and believing God's promises. When you trust God in His promises, you literally can do anything for His glory. Because you know that whether you live or die, His glory is the goal. The righteous live by faith. Now the first point I want you to see, friends, is that the righteous live by faith by possessing the faith of Abraham. You see this in verses 8 of chapter 11. Verses 8 through 12. Let's read that together. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse number 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Would you pray with me? Father, my prayer is that this morning you would be glorified, that we would, during this time, contemplate your glory Thank on your glory and that we would leave here with your glory on our hearts and minds. Lord, I pray that folks will see your glory here this morning. How glorious you are. What's remarkable, re remarkable about these stories, Lord, is not ultimately the faith of your people, but how glorious you are. It was your glory that motivated men and women to leave everything behind and follow you. And so, Lord, may we get a glimpse of your glory fresh and new today. And may sinners repent and believe because you are glorious. In Christ's name, amen. We see possessing the faith of Abraham. Possessing the faith of Abraham. Let me just read you in Genesis 12, 1 through 4. Now the Lord said to Abram, which later became Abraham, right? His name was changed. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed Herod. You know, God's word says in Genesis 15, 6, And he, Abraham, believed the Lord, and he counted, to, counted it to him as righteousness. And we learn in the book of Romans that we're to have the faith of Abraham. And so, first off, I want to say that Abraham was saved not because of what he did. He was saved because of his trust in Yahweh and his promises. He was saved through faith, the same way we are. No person has ever been saved by their good works. No one. What we need is a perfect righteousness outside of ourselves. We do not believe in a works salvation. We believe in a salvation that works. We do not believe that you can earn your salvation. We believe Christ has earned our salvation. And if you believe that, it's going to motivate you to live for Him. If you can get your mind, and if I can get my mind wrapped around how glorious God is, sin 
loses its appeal. So we see in verses 9 and 10, from Genesis, it's from Genesis 12 and Genesis 35, that Abraham continued in faith, going to live in the land of promise, <coughs> living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. And in verse 10, it, the author of Hebrews reveals that it was because he was looking to a city. So even Abraham wasn't ultimately looking at the physical promised land. He was looking at a heavenly city. He was looking ahead to a heavenly promise. And we learn, and the author of uh, Romans, Paul, argues later on that Jesus Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of all nations being blessed through Abraham. That Jesus is the seed, singular, of Abraham, the fulfillment of this original promise and covenant promise with Abraham. Right? I, I know there's mystery there, but it's important for us to understand why the emphasis of children of promise. Right? Why the one and only son <coughs> emphasis in the Old Testament, right? Why this lineage emphasis? Because it ultimately points to God giving his one and only son for sinners. And so we see in verse 11, and this is point number two, the righteous live by faith by possessing the faith of Sarah. So it's not just the faith of Abraham that is emphasized here. It's also the faith of Sarah, his wife. By faith, Sarah received power to have a baby, even though she was past childbearing age. Now, I'm not going to turn back there, but if you go back and read uh, concerning this story... The Bible teaches that Sarah actually laughed. And then, when God confronted her about her laughing, she lied to God. Again, I, I, the reason why I'm pointing this out is to show you, to humanize those in the Old Testament to where you, you and I realize that these great, even though they're in the hall of faith, and even though they serve as examples of faith, they were not perfect. They still needed Jesus. That is the author of Hebrews' point. That these people were saved by faith. He's emphasizing how the righteous live by faith. That all these accomplishments that are listed here are a result of believing God and His promises. You want to know why John G. Patton is willing to go to an island of cannibals to share the gospel? Because he believes his God is sovereign. Similar to how Daniel and the lions did, right? God can shut the mouth of the lions, or He can shut the mouth of cannibals and open their ears to hear the gospel. That's what He believed. And you know what? What's amazing is that God converted thousands of cannibals into Christians. God saved thousands of people. People who used to eat other people, repenting of that, throwing their idols away. It's remarkable. I, I posted a brief book on our social media, Cumberland Homestead's Baptist Church Facebook page. I want to encourage you after church to go read it. Don't open your phone and read it now, please. But go after <laughs> church and read that. Take 30 minutes to an hour and read that remarkable story of how God used someone to reach cannibals with the saving gospel of Christ. And there's other remarkable stories. Whenever uh, I went on a mission trip, it's been about four years ago to Ecuador, and we actually stopped by uh, Nate Saint's home. Y'all know who Nate Saint was? Y'all know who Jim Elliott was? Jim Elliott was one of the missionaries. There were five missionaries in the 60s, I believe, who were martyred trying to get the gospel to cannibals in Ecuador. And they got down off, they, they had... You know, in that terrain, many times it would take weeks to get to these people on a donkey or on horses. It would take a long time because of the terrain. Well, what they were doing, they set up a little airport, and so they were able to fly in. And they were circling over, and they were dropping stuff down to these cannibals like gifts. Trying, and so, that, so they thought that they had built enough rapport with these cannibals by giving them gifts. And so they landed the plane. And these five missionaries get off. And they're wanting to share the gospel. They're wanting to reach these men with the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of them had a gun. One of the missionaries had a gun. And what's interesting is those rounds were fired, but they were fired in the sky or in the ground. Those men were killed 
within a few minutes or hours after getting off that plane, they were speared. And what's remarkable about, about this story, friends, is that Nate Saint's wife, I believe, and Jim Elliott's widow, right? They're both, they're widows. Went back and shared the gospel with those cannibals. And I don't know if it's still going on today, but they were converted. And the man who actually killed Jim Elliott was saved. And he goes around preaching with Jim Elliott's son. Which is a wonderful testimony of the gospel. Think about it. The, going and preaching with the fellow who killed your father. It's amazing how God has brought about... You know, imagine the faith of those widows going back and sharing the gospel. And we learned about uh, John Patton. John Patton, wasn't long after he got there that his wife died. She caught a fever and died when he got to the islands. And a week later, his newborn baby died. He stayed for four years before getting run off. He went back home. So he ran for his life, got back home. And you know what he did when he got home? He raised support to go back. <laughs> he tried to get other missionaries to go. And he ended up remarrying and he went back and he stayed for 41 years serving. And even at age 73, he was trying to raise support for others to go share the gospel with these headhunting cannibals. I, friend, it's remarkable to read these stories, but I want to encourage you that the same God that he served you and I served, the same God that Abraham served, that Sarah served, you and I serve. He is perfectly sovereign. You see in verse 12, Therefore from Abraham, a man who was past childbearing age, was born descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And the Bible teaches again that Abraham laughed as well. You know, they did, their faith was not perfect. But yet they did respond in obedience to the Lord. And so we see the righteous live by faith. We need to possess the faith of Abraham, a faith that acts on God's promises, the faith of Sarah, a faith that trusts in God's promises. And then, in verses 13 through 16, the righteous live by faith by trusting God's promise of our eternal inheritance. You see, verse 13, that these all died in faith, having received the things promised, but having seen... Not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. And having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For, he, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And so you see in verse 13, friend, that all, all those mentioned earlier in this chapter died in faith, looking afar at the promises. I mean, Christ hadn't even been sent yet. The fulfillment that they were looking for had not even come yet. The seed of Abraham that Isaac pointed to had not even come yet, ultimately. And so they saw these realities from afar and trusted that God would bring them about. And also we see that they were seeking a greater homeland, a world beyond this one, a perfect homeland, a world without sin, corruption, and death. They desired a heavenly country. And what's very interesting in verse number 16, friend, is that God is not ashamed to be called their God. Isn't that interesting? Abraham committed adultery. He lied. He committed many sins. So did these others that are mentioned in the Hall of Faith. But you know what? God is not ashamed to be called their God. And friend, when you and I feel He's not ashamed to be called our God either. Because we are saved, not based on how wonderful we are, but how wonderful Christ was in our stead and is today. And that should motivate us to live the Christian life, to live for the Lord's glory. Because we do not get to heaven based on how great we are, we're saying another has been great for us. What I want you to know, what I want you to be reminded of, is that when we could not save ourselves, God became man to save us. 
that God came and lived, Jesus Christ came and lived through, right? He came and lived the life that God required of us and then died the death that we deserved. He didn't stay dead, rose from the dead, conquering death. And friend, if you'll repent and believe in Him, He'll save you to the uttermost. God is not ashamed to be called the God of people who have faith in Him because they believe Him, His promises, and He has prepared for us a city. You know, it's amazing. God's promises frees us to not worry. Frees us to not worry. Because if God is sovereign, you know, I, I think of these games like March Madness is coming up, right? Amen? Come on, y'all gotta like March Madness. Everybody likes March Madness, right? Amen. I know it's not YouTube football. I know, it's, but it's gotta be second, right? It's gotta be up there somewhere. March Madness. Come on, over this section. Can I get an amen from over here? Oh my God. There we go. Thank you. See? And you teach actually good this year, the men. Right? All right, so, so March Madness is coming up. Now, the problem with March Madness, and also what makes it great, is that there's one winner and 63 losers. Right? It's what makes it great and what makes it awful. But a lot of those young kids, I say kids because I'm 37 now, so I'm, I look at them as kids. I know they're not kids. Young men and women, friends, some of them, their dreams are going to be crushed. Right? But what's amazing with sports is that at the end of the day, they don't ultimately matter. And what's amazing about our jobs and how successful we are in our vocation and how good we did X, Y, or Z, do you realize that the ultimate battle that matters in life, Jesus Christ has already won for you? The battle against sin, the battle against death, the battle against the evil one. The battle against the wickedness within. The battle against everything that plagues creation has already been won by Christ. It's coming to pass. It's more certain than the sun rising. God has promised to bring it to pass. And friend, knowing that reality frees you to win at life, to be successful at life for the glory of God, and to not be successful for the glory of God. So whether you win or lose, if God's glory is the goal, it frees you, right? It frees you. Gives you great freedom. And friend, I wish I had known that when I was a kid playing basketball. As you can see, not much of an athlete. But I did play basketball back in the day. We were the Catskill Bees. I know. What a mascot, right? The bees. I guess you could swarm. A swarm of bees is scary. You got the Panthers and you got the bees, right? Who's going to win that one? Um, but, but in all seriousness, right? I wish I had known. I wish I had understood. Because it's heart-wrenching and heartbreaking whenever you try to do something and you fail, right? Whenever you try, whenever you try your best at something and you still don't succeed based on the Lord's standards. But I want you to know, friend, that what Christ has done frees you to bow, frees you from having to bow down to other people's opinions of you. If you're trusting in Christ, your salvation is secure forevermore. And nothing can change that. And no one's opinion of you can change that. So we see that the righteous live by faith, by possessing the faith of Abraham, by possessing the faith of Sarah, by trusting God's promises concerning our eternal inheritance, and finally, trusting God's promise and love to bless all nations through Abraham's <coughs> son. And actually, through God's Son. Friend, I want to encourage you to turn to Genesis 22. Turn to Genesis 22. Let's read this remarkable story concerning Isaac. Genesis 22. It 
Genesis 22, 1 through 18. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place in which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I, the boy, will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. And when they came to the place in which God told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And then we learn, flip back over to Hebrews, and look at verse 17 through 19. We learn what was on Abraham's mind, right? He knew that this was the child of promise. And see, what, what's so significant, friends, is that God called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram was a pagan. When he was called. An idol worshiper. Worshiping false gods. When God called him out of Ur. The Chaldeans. And not only that. But God told him to leave behind your family. Leave behind your father. Leave behind your household. And he left. In obedience to Yahweh. And what's amazing is. Abraham knew that Yahweh does not demand human sacrifice. Not only that. But Abraham knew that he was not like the false gods of the Chaldeans. The gods that his father worshipped. Abraham knew that Yahweh was different. That Yahweh was real. That Yahweh keeps his promises. See, if you go and read about the Chaldean gods, they later became the Babylonians. And you read about their gods and they mimic men. They're sinful. They're evil. But Abraham knew that Yahweh wasn't. He knew that if he promised something, he would bring it to pass. The author of Hebrews picks this up and notice what he says. In verse 17, he says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Now look at verse 19. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So, Abraham was willing to take Isaac, by the way, up on Mount Moriah. Y'all know this, you understand the significance in the Old Testament concerning pagan gods and mountains. Right? Much of the worship that took place concerning paganism in the Old Testament happened on mountains. Because there's something, if you've ever, even today, whenever I went to a mission trip in Ecuador, many of the 
folks who worshipped, if they were involved in any form of paganism or animism, it, it was associated with a mountain. Right? They would go up. There's something mysterious. I mean, you think about it. When you're looking up, you ever seen a big mountain? I'm not talking about around here, right? You ever seen a big mountain and you see the clouds and how... I mean, there, there is mystery there. Imagine being back in this time period. Right? And so they would go up on this mountain. So, so everything about this, right? Everything about this points to things that Abraham knew concerning the Chaldean gods. Okay? But notice what he's believing here. He believes that Yahweh is different. That Yahweh is faithful. That Yahweh is in control. That Yahweh doesn't demand human sacrifice. That Yahweh keeps His promises. I mean, all these things he's assuming and believing about Yahweh that he was not taught to believe when he was young. Friends, it's important for us to wrap our minds around what is going on here. Because, I, friend, I guess what I'm saying is, is Abraham should not be someone we're reading about in the Bible. Someone that is held up as an amazing example. But you know why he is? Because God changed him. God changed him. And what's amazing is, is he left all that behind to follow God. And he trusted God so much that this wonderful child that God had given him, this child of promise, this descendant through which all nations are going to be blessed, and if God demands him, he's going to offer him. Because he believed that God would keep his promise that even if he had killed his son, God would raise him from the dead. And friend, the point is not ultimately about Abraham and Isaac. What that ultimately points to is God giving his son. And you realize that God gave his one and only son, but God did not provide another sacrifice. There was no ram caught in the thicket at Calvary. There was the King of kings and Lord of lords crucified between two guilty thieves. And when those Roman soldiers couldn't think of anything that Jesus Christ was guilty of, they just nailed King of the Jews above his head. They put your crime above your head. Jesus had no crimes. The author of Hebrews tells us that Abraham was willing to offer his only son Isaac. He knew that God wasn't like the false gods he grew up worshiping. He knew that God would provide. He knew that God could not lie. And he trusted his promises. And so, friend, how do we apply this? Well, I want you to think about the amazing realities that we believe about God. We believe God is sovereign. Meaning we believe God is in control of all things. He either does all things or he permits it. Nothing can get to us unless it gets through the finger, fingers of God. God is all good. He cannot lie. His promises He will bring about. He literally cannot do otherwise. God is all-knowing. No one can outsmart God. God is all-knowing from eternity past. He knows all knowledge that is possible. God is all-powerful. He literally can change everything. God is all-wise. Everything He does is wise. Everything He permits is due to His omnisapiens, His wisdom. Everything He knows is due to His ultimate wisdom and allows. God is all-present. Many, He's always with everyone, but He's especially with His people. He dwells our hearts. And the only battle that eternally matters has been won for us by Christ. Literally, death has been defeated. The penalty for our sins has been paid in full. And our eternal inheritance has been secured. Now, if you believe all those realities, and those are, those are all actually elementary principles that we teach children from a young age. God is always with you. God is all-powerful. God knows everything. God is all good. He never does evil. I mean, you think about all those basic things that we teach you. We teach them Jesus died for their sins, rose from the dead to forgive them. He's the only way of salvation. Those glorious realities. Think about how that should impact your daily life and my daily life. I remember at the first church I served as youth pastor, Cedar Hill Baptist Church in Baxter, Tennessee. One lady, they, they were asking her, 
Um, she was raised in church, but had gotten out of church in college. And so they asked her, she, we were asking about her testimony, you know, what caused you to return? And she said somebody in college asked her if she really believed these things. Because, friend, if you really believe these things, you can't live like they're not true. You can try. But, friend, you know why I don't take a step off the roof? Because of gravity. Right? I don't, I don't even have to think about it. What goes up must what? Come down. Come down. And I, I do not like heights. Amen. I do not like heights. And so I, I believe that to be true concerning if I climb a tree and step off, I'm going to fall. And I don't want that. The righteous live by faith. And where biblical faith is, action follows. And so if you believe that God is sovereign, how is that going to affect your life? Let, let me ask you this. So my mother suffers with Parkinson's. And she's in stage 4 kidney failure. How do you think God being sovereign and knowing that He is love and knowing that He is all-present and knowing that He is all-powerful affects how I view her Parkinson's? How do you think it affects how she views her Parkinson's? Do you realize that Parkinson's will eventually take her mind but it will not take her salvation? Amen. Do you realize that thieves can come in and take everything you have or the government can or do you realize that someone can come take your lawn, but they can't take your salvation? I mean, so think about living this life. Think about believing these wonderful realities. Because there are going to be disappointments in this life. There are going to be things that you fail in. There are going to be things that happen to you concerning illness and sickness and, and, and cancer and disease. And friend, I want you to know that though... Some of these things might be taken from you. Your salvation cannot be strong. And there is wonderful freedom in that reality. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. I believe we need to be good stewards. I drink wheatgrass every morning. All right? So I'm trying to live longer. Or I wouldn't drink grass. Amen? It tastes like grass. But it's supposed to help me, so I drink it. All right? So I'm trying to live longer, but also I want you to know that Christ's finished work has freed me to enjoy salvation whenever I'm healthy, whenever I'm sick, whenever I'm wealthy, whenever I'm poor, whenever my bills are paid and they're not, whenever my mother is healthy and she's not, when she has good days and bad days, what Christ has done for me is constant. So I want to challenge you, friend, to base your joy on that wonderful reality so how will you and I live as a result of believing these realities? Will we do these things? Will we, as the Bible says, deny ourselves, pick up our crosses, and follow Christ regardless what it costs us? Because you realize that following Christ will never, ever cost you your salvation. It will never cost you your inheritance. Following Christ will never cost you more than you receive. Ever. So friend, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. If you lose your family, your friends, your jobs, your livelihood, or your very life, if you're in Christ, you'll never lose your salvation. So what will you do with this wonderful reality how will you live as a result? I want to encourage you to think through how the Lord might have you apply the faith that is presented in Scripture. As Brother Kenny comes and leads us in him invitation, I want to invite you to come. Perhaps you've never experienced the salvation that I've talked about here this morning. Friend, if you'll repent and believe in Christ, you realize that He'll save you, that He'll clean you up. Regardless of what you've done, He will forgive you of your sins if you come to Jesus. How will you respond? I, I tell you what, I enjoy salvation. I enjoy the grace of God. And it's not because I am wonderful. I fail every day. But you know what? When I fail, I know that there's an advocate who defends me with his own blood. 
And you know what? Where I fail, he doesn't. And though I struggle with sin, he doesn't. And he says that I'm his. And friend, you can know that as much as I do. Let's all stand and sing. In his time.
Uh, Brother Jerry York, we did this in prayer for Let's pray. Dear yeah. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this day. And as always, especially thank you for the message that we've heard, that you are always there. And our faith and our, our life with you is always secure. Lord, I pray now that you be with those that are missing here who have uh, with Denver and with others who are sick and going forward with, with different things that are happening. And Lord, I pray that you be with each one. Lord, I also pray now that you be with our church, that you give us the strength and the courage to reach the community around us. And we thank you and pray there. Amen.